Today I've decided to ditch my tripod and come to the coast to shoot some landscape photography. So I thought I would share a pro tip for getting sharp, well exposed photos whilst also having the flexibility to be reactive to light and also retain complete creative control over your camera. So I'm walking part of the Pembrokeshire Coastal Path today, heading towards St Govan's Chapel, which is an incredible location. So I'm hopeful we can get some shots there later. But I stumbled across this beach here, which by the way, absolutely spectacular. Just stunning, beautiful golden sand amongst these craggy rocks either side. <sighs> this place is just breathtaking, especially when the skies are blue and bright like they are today. So if you watch this channel regularly, you'll know that I typically have my camera set up in full manual mode, so I generally prefer a slower paced approach to my photography. But the idea of handheld photography is that you can be free of the restraints of a tripod and be more reactive to the conditions as they change around you. But for me, this requires a more reactive camera setup to ensure I can quickly adapt my camera settings to the conditions. If I'm shooting family life, weddings or portraits, typically I will use aperture priority mode as this allows me to set my aperture and then the camera chooses the shutter speed for me to give me a balanced exposure. I then just adjust the exposure compensation dial to change my exposure, either darken or brighten the scene. Now this works great for the most part, but clearly this restricts my creative choices with my shutter speed being chosen for me. So for outdoor or landscape or wildlife photography, shutter speed is a choice that I would prefer to be in complete control of myself. So I've got a neat little trick that I use to get complete control over my aperture and shutter speed while also allowing me to adapt to the conditions very, very quickly. So definitely some super cool shots here with these rock formations. The scene must come right up here, right up to the top and wash into these caves and it smooths all this sand out, which looks absolutely amazing. Some beautiful colours actually here with these grey stones, some seaweed dotted about too, and like three caves that are all kind of leaning at 45 degrees, which looks fantastic. So I'm just moving around, taking a series of shots handheld, trying not to make any footprints in the sand because I don't want to ruin my composition. But yeah, great fun here, could spend quite a bit of time, but I think focusing on a couple of compositions is the key thing. So roughly speaking, my camera settings are around about hundredths of a second here, F8 ISO 320. And that's allowing me to get enough detail in the caves. Some areas are slightly black or underexposed, which is fine. Don't think we need to see right into the back of the caves, but it's more a case of these wonderful rock formations that we've got here in the foreground. Beautiful, really nice little find this. Absolutely stunning. Right, let's see if we can move around without ruining this beautiful sand. Well, what a nice little find. I think we might have to come back down here with a few beers and a barbecue. Let's go. So most modern DSLR and mirrorless cameras will have four modes of shooting. Program mode, which lets the camera choose the shutter speed and aperture for a balanced exposure. Then we've got aperture priority, which allows the user to select the aperture and then the camera selects the shutter speed. Then we've got shutter priority, which allows the user to select the shutter speed and the camera selects the aperture. And then we've got full manual mode where the user chooses all of those settings, you know, gives them complete creative control basically. But there's also a hidden mode that you can set as well that allows the photographer to have full manual control of the aperture and the shutter but the camera controls the ISO for you for a balanced exposure. And it is this last method that we're using today, but more on that in a minute, because we've got some exploring to do. So I'm just experimenting here, looking down this cliff edge, which is absolutely amazing. It's 
The colour of the water is just incredible. A real deep greeny blue colour, which contrasts really well with these amazing rock formations that we've got down here. Yeah, so telephoto's on. I'm just trying to pick out some detail as the water's swirling around the rocks. Got the polarizer on at the minute. I might even put an ND filter on, see if I can get a little bit more motion blur within the water. Fantastic little spot though. It is more of an intimate shot. I did think about a wider shot here because these rock formations are fantastic. However, so there's nothing really in the background that's gonna help aid a wider shot. So yeah, focusing more on the details down here. But yeah, absolutely beautiful. So that was a lot of fun. I managed to get some sharp shots down there at one tenth of a second at 140 mil, which is 200 mil on the full frame equivalent. So that's pretty cool. I was uh, enjoying that actually, just shooting down there, picking out different textures and patterns. Absolutely love that style of photography. I think it's brilliant. You can lose yourself for hours, can't you? But anyway, we haven't even got to St. Govan's Chapel yet. <laughs> Best we press on. Oh, don't leave your filters behind. There's a few reasons I like to have full control over both aperture and shutter speed when shooting handheld. So first up, let's talk about the aperture setting. Now think of aperture as serving two purposes. It covers depth of field and light. The bigger the aperture or the smaller the F number, the more light that we let into the sensor. The bigger the aperture, the less depth of field we have to work with. So I always think about aperture first before anything else. You know, do I want a large or small depth of field to make my composition work? Typically for my landscape photos, I like a large depth of field. So I like to get my foreground and background exceptionally sharp. So generally speaking, depth of field required will determine my aperture setting, if that makes sense. Then I look at my shutter speed. Now, usually for handheld landscapes, there are several considerations. Firstly, camera shake. You know, can you hand hold your camera without introducing camera shake into your image? Typically, you want your shutter speed to be equal or more than the focal length that you're using. So if you're shooting with a 50 millimeter lens, you want 1 50th of a second and above, which should give you a sharp image. But I guess there is a bit of a difference now with the modern cameras because a lot of modern cameras have IBIS and it is possible to get much longer shutter speeds with a camera that does have IBIS, but you're gonna to need to test that out for yourself and see what works for you and your camera setup. The next consideration for me would be motion and that's motion within the image. Are you looking to show motion blur or are you looking to freeze everything within your frame? Obviously, this is a personal creative choice and depends on how fast the elements in, in the scene are moving. And this is why being able to control both the shutter speed and the aperture is so important for landscape photography. So this scene's pretty cool. There's this sea stack down here, triangular shape, which is quite nice. Got some wonderful lichens on the tops of these boulders here again, which is really adding some color and texture to this shot. Lovely cloud patterns as well. And some beautiful light the other side of the cliffs. Now I'm having to bracket this shot. So hand holding and bracketing is fine. You just have to be really steady with your hands. Make sure it doesn't move in between shots. I've got mine set up to bracket for five shots at one stop increments. And that's uh, getting me everything that I need in this shot here in terms of exposure. One thing I see quite a lot of, quite a bit on YouTube as well actually, is people taking shots like this. It's not a great idea shooting handheld like this. It's probably the most unstable position that you could possibly take a photo. I will always recommend putting it up to your eye, put the eyepiece up to your eye. That way you've got three points of contact with your body. Your elbows are tucked in. It's a real nice stable platform in which to work and that will get you sharper images. This is absolutely beautiful. Some really nice swells coming in now as well. Anyway, we've not even made it to the chapel yet. Something tells me it's gonna be disappointing. <laughs> I'm building it up, aren't I? So, 
finally made it to the chapel, which is great. Oh, this is pretty cool. Love how the way it's built into this rock face. It's just incredible. Absolutely brilliant. Let's go and look inside. Pretty cool. awesome this place especially when you've got a big swell running as well it's just a, even more dramatic which is cool there's a stone arch down here that I'm really interested in photographing maybe see if we can get something of this well the light's quite flat in here at the minute but we'll give it a go anyway so this neat little trick is kind of hidden away on most cameras, but if you put your camera into manual mode, which gives you complete control over aperture, shutter speed and ISO, you'll find that you can set up your ISO to be controlled by the camera, meaning that you set up the aperture and shutter speed and the camera chooses the right ISO to suit the scene in front of you, creating a balanced exposure. This feature on my camera is called Auto ISO and can be found at the bottom of the ISO values as I rotate the ISO dial. Now this means I can quickly select my shutter speed and aperture to suit my composition and if I need to brighten or darken the shot I can do so by adjusting the exposure compensation which in turn changes the ISO, meaning my shutter speed and aperture will not be affected by this change. If the light in your scene changes over a period of time, the camera will maintain the correct exposure by fluctuating the ISO. Now, it does take a bit of getting used to, but it means you can be really reactive without compromising your creative settings. And I think that's really, really important. Now, I wouldn't worry too much about shooting at higher ISOs. Most cameras can give really nice results up to ISO 3200, and you can always clean up your image in post if required. And it's always better, I think, to get a noisy, sharp image than a blurred one. At least you can correct the noise later on, or you can't with a blurred shot. Now, there are a couple of problems with this method, which we'll take a look at in a minute. But first, I need to run down the bottom here and grab a couple of shots of this water splashing over these rocks. So the main problem with shooting auto ISO is you'll find that once you reach your lowest ISO, that your exposure compensation will no longer affect the exposure if you're trying to darken the image. This is because it doesn't have any further to go. You know, it's reached its lowest point. In this instance, you'll have to stop down the aperture, increase the shutter speed, or use an ND filter. So that is something to bear in mind if you're rotating your exposure compensation dial and nothing is happening. So I've been scrambling over these rocks down here for about the past 15 minutes trying to make a composition work and it's been particularly challenging. There's a troublesome beast in my composition which is this triangular rock down here in my foreground. It's very dark so it's been quite difficult to make that work. Uh, you know, trying to fit that in with the stone arch and the cliffs in the background. Yes, it's been quite difficult. However, I think I've made something work at least and uh, I'm sure, pretty sure I've got something here been taking quite a few different shots and that's the beauty of handheld photography isn't it you can move around and be a lot more reactive whereas if you've got your tripod set up you're kind of stuck and it's a bit more troublesome to move it so this technique does take a bit of getting used to like I mentioned earlier but I think with a bit of perseverance it can really help your reactive photography photography on the fly you know when you want to quickly grab a shot but want to be in complete control If you'd like to learn more about my photography process from the shoot right through to the final print, please be sure to check out this video over here. Please be sure to share it or like it and subscribe if you've not done so already. That really helps me out. Anyway guys, until next week, take care and I'll see you soon.